to understand that this region is one of the highest concentrations of rare and endangered species on the planet. Um, this land that Western has has as many federally endangered species as Great Smoky Mountains National Park, which has 600,000 acres of land. The animals are fascinating, diverse, Many of them are important players in the environment in curious ways. This tract is part of Western's Green River Preserve. This tract contains 350 acres of land on Lawler Bend, which includes three miles of frontage on the Green River, which is one of the most biodiverse rivers in the United States probably about nine federally endangered aquatic species in this area, and, and a couple of federally endangered bats as well. Well, Green River specifically is kind of a biological hotspot for a rare species, mussels, bats particularly. And that's kind of the business we're in is, is habitat conservation. So catching any bats nowadays is pretty significant because they're all declining, or a lot of them are declining. But, you know, here in the Mammoth Cave region, there's species that have been endangered for a long time, and there's other species that are probably gonna be listed very soon. And so we're kind of trying to assess their populations on WKU's property. Got out here earlier today and set up our nets. We picked a good net lane. We wanted to pick an area like this creek that we're set up in where bats will kind of funnel through it. They don't wanna go through the thick woods any more than you do or a bunch of brush. So you pick natural corridors. We set up the nets about 30 meters high, and we just wait till the bat flies in it. We check them about every 10 or 15 minutes. We want to catch them. We want to get them out almost as quick as they're in it because number one, we don't want them to get tangled and don't want them to be injured. That's the highest priority. And also we don't want them to chew through the net because bats have teeth and they'll chew and there'll be holes in the net. <laughs> Once we catch a bat, we uh, put it in a bag to keep it uh, safe and protected so that it doesn't hurt its wings uh, flopping around, flailing around. Once we get back here to our processing site, we'll take the bat out of the bag, uh, look at a variety of different characteristics to determine the species of bat. Uh, as odd as it sounds, we'll look at everything from toe hair length on it to how thick an ankle bone essentially is. That's uh, some of the indicators of what species we have in hand. Once we determine the species, we're looking at if it's an adult or a juvenile, uh, how long the forearm is on it, uh, which is another indicator of what species it is. Uh, we'll weigh it and uh, ultimately, depending on what species it is, we'll put an identification tag or a bat band on its forearm. A lot of species we have here will actually spend their summers in Kentucky and then they'll move north and they'll overwinter in a cave in, uh, say, Michigan. So these things are, uh, they're very mobile, for one. Additionally, we'll look for any evidence of white nose syndrome that I talked about earlier, any sort of wing damage that it has will indicate that. That shows us uh, uh, how the individual is doing health-wise. With white nose syndrome, they're showing mortality rates of up to 96% in some of the caves that that's been impacted with. Uh, it's been in Kentucky now for two to three years, so we're on the, the first wave of it. Uh, these next few years will really be the, the make or break time. That's it. That's it. Waiting down. It's just fun to get out here. You know, it's uh, it's important to do. I feel like that uh, the data that we collect is uh, is a contribution to the scientific community. Uh, it's also good to see long term if some of the management work that we're doing is showing an increase in bat diversity or bat use in an area. It's just important to have uh, have this sort of data be collected. So far, we've caught uh, the tricolored bat. It used to be called the eastern pipistrelle. It's one of the smallest species of bat we have in the state. We will probably catch uh, red bats, which are uh, a year-round tree roosting bat or a forest bat. They are uh, bright red, especially the males are really bright red. They'll hang upside down off the end of a tree branch and you would think that they'd be pretty easily spotted, but they actually hang and just kind of float in the breeze and make it look like a, a dead leaf hanging off the end of a uh, branch. We could catch uh, two endangered species in the area, federally endangered. Uh, Gray bats are federally endangered, but they are fairly common in this area. Uh, they'll forage up and down the river all night long, so we have a good chance of catching those, as well as the uh, federally endangered Indiana bat. There's nothing else like them. They're, they are really 
odd <laughs> compared to what you know the the cartoons of the flying mice you know everybody thinks of once you get one in your hand and you really look at it there's really nothing else like them they're really really neat their wing structure they look basically like your hand with uh, webbed fingers that they can flap and fly around with it's just really really strange it's a strange creature and it's really cool and i think a lot of people don't realize too that you know we're here in the in the woods catching Woodland bats, um, you know, there's bats in everybody's neighborhood. If you got a big cemetery with old trees, you got a park, those red bats are flying around in those trees. If you look at the skyline at dusk in just about any place with, with trees, <laughs> there are bats. And um, so they're, they're around more than you think, um, depending on the species. We really don't know, to be honest with you, what, uh, what this will happen if we decimate our bat population. They're obviously, they're a way of providing, um, bringing energy into a cave system from the, basically from outside of the cave into the cave when they enter and exit each night. We don't know how all these processes work. So we don't have any idea of knowing what sort of impacts this will have to everything from agriculture to just our day-to-day -day lives by not having bats around. We want to manage these properties that we, that we uh, are involved with, kind of maximize habitat for species, really all species, but particularly rare species. So before you can manage for those species, you got to figure out what lives there, basically. That's in a nutshell. And you know, as far as why that's important to begin with, the root of it is, you know, we just feel that biodiversity is important in general. You know, we don't know what some of these species do and how they can benefit us, as well as just, you know, they're here, so we need to keep them around. Um, our bat populations particularly, uh, you know, eat a lot of bugs, and so it would not be good for, for agriculture or, you know, sitting out on your deck if all the bats were gone as well. For the land that's here, it's protected in perpetuity, but the important thing, I think, is to give the public an appreciation for the wonderful environments of Kentucky, because there are still spectacular places, and we can do so much to improve on them. That's one of the things that's also very pleasurable. This land has all been disturbed in various ways by humans, but we can work to make it better. We can't, it's not just preservation we're doing here. This place is getting better with time as people work on it. It's just wonderful seeing students being able to do this. We do not have a virgin forest here, but we have things that are still lovely and exciting and different, and we can do better. I think you need to know that human beings have extraordinary opportunities to enjoy, love, and improve this world, and we have all sorts of possibilities for creating catastrophes. And it's going to be up to people to decide which direction we're going to go with all these things.